Hi, this is Lex, and welcome to the Fintech Blueprint. It's your podcast about fintech, decentralized finance, digital banking, investing, robo-advice, artificial intelligence, and all the other frontier technology that is transforming financial services. To get more content, like an illustrated transcript of this conversation in your inbox, subscribe at fintechblueprint.com. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode. Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's conversation. I have with us today David Shuttleworth, who is the Managing Director of Token Engineering at Binance. And of course, we work together on crypto economics at Consensus. And we are going to spend some time trying to pull apart shenanigans, the financial shenanigans around FTX, the liquidation cascade, as well as trying to figure out something a little bit more substantive as it relates to actual crypto ecosystem design and the trends that are going on in the future. David, welcome to the podcast. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So I'm going to set the stage for us a little bit. We are in this very bizarre moment where on the day that this is recorded, Sam Bankman Fried actually had like an hour long interview with the New York Times where he was sort of displayed in this Wizard of Oz fashion in front of a lot of people that I assume paid to to watch him talk. And you know, the transcript was published on the Times website. And there's still this sort of like weird mystery about what had happened. Did SBF simply choose to take customer funds and plug a hole in his prop trading shop, i.e. things that the Volcker rule would say are not a good idea? Or was he a genius wunderkind who had gone too fast and the wheels fell off and now he's surprised by the destruction that was raw, which is five, 10, $15 billion worth of customer deposits gone forever? What do you think? What happened? There's a, there's a lot to unpack there. I think first and foremost, I think we've seen some kind of odd coverage of, of Sam. I think that you have pieces like in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, other popular media outlets that kind of frame FTX and his collapse as, you know, it's kind of the result of mismanagement rather than malfeasance. And I think there's like a key distinction there, right? As you mentioned, like, you know, FTX... There were some weird things going on behind the scenes and also with their hedge fund, Alameda Research. It seems like, and I think the on-chain data is going to reveal this and more, you know, a lot more clarity there. But it seems like, you know, FTX was going counter to what a lot of their, you know, their customer agreements were, where they would not, they would not trade or use customer funds like, you know, like a normal bank would do. They would simply hold them like one to one. And I think that things unraveled. And we've seen that that is actually not the case. You know, FTX was very much commingled with Alameda. Alameda was using customer funds to do risky bets. And FTX was kind of supplying them and funneling them into Alameda's balance sheet. And like that was going back and forth. Again, we don't know the depth of what this was occurring, but I know it's starting to get pieced together more and more. And this seems like this is what was going on for quite some time. And that's kind of what set the stage for a failure was that, you know, ultimately customer funds were not indeed one to one as they should have been. They were being, something was being done with them. They were, they were kind of being rehypothecated behind the scenes and unbeknownst to customers. So when they went to withdraw, you know, my one Bitcoin is no longer one Bitcoin is now a half of a Bitcoin and so forth. I think that's kind of a, a very broad overview of kind of what transpired. We'll contextualize it in looking at the overall kind of liquidation cascade, like the the financial failure, the crisis that has happened in which FTX is but one of the dominoes that had fallen. And we'll talk about that chain. And we'll also talk about, I think, the distinction between a broker dealer or an exchange trying to grow out of the crypto industry, you know, trying to support the development of technology, the new Web3 economy and all of that with financial services and the difference between that. But before we get to sort of those slightly more existential questions, I want to meditate on FTX and what is the thing that Sam says that he means when he says it, right? And so to put it into perspective, there's two companies. One is Alameda Research, that is a maybe a hedge fund, maybe a market maker. Regardless, that's a prop desk. That's a capital markets prop desk that, of course, he and a bunch of others 
own. And it has strategies to use capital in order to create some return. Perhaps not very well. It has capital that it puts into various markets in order to earn yields and fees. And you know the market-making strategy is such that you take both sides of the market and you make sure that there's liquidity, meaning that a third party can come in and do a trade, and they might do that trade against a market maker who will be on one side of the trade and figure out how to hedge the other side or you know just has deeper connections into other exchanges or, or desks or whatever it is. And so Alameda's market-making capability we think evolved out of its original arbitrage in Asia around Bitcoin prices between exchanges and the Korean exchanges and so on. But the market making capability was kind of key to FTX. And FTX is a retail footprint. It was an exchange that tried to have lots of users and the users that went there were active traders and they went there after BitMEX blew up, right? And so BitMEX's invention was you can come here and without any KYC AML, you can lever up a hundred times and take out like a derivative position on any of these crypto assets that went as you would expect. And so FTX became kind of the next version of that. And Alameda was the market maker in FTX. And Sam at one point in this interview in the New York Times says that 40%, in the beginning, 40% of the trading float was Alameda sort of manufacturing the illusion of trading or you know creating liquidity. What's your view on sort of like this setup? Like how weird is it? How normal is it? Like what should we think of this? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to kind of what people killed Arthur Hayes for. And I think Arthur Hayes was trying to create a product that hadn't been done yet. BitMEX was super successful. But then all these allegations came out that, hey, like BitMEX is trading against its customers. Like they can see, basically they can see behind the curtains, right? If I'm a, re- if I'm a, a regular retail customer and I'm using like say BitMEX to, to long Bitcoin and, and say you're shorting it, like we're, we're, we have, you know, we're opposing bets. I don't know what your liquidation price is. You don't know what mine is, right? We can kind of guess, we can estimate, we don't know. Well, the exchange does know. And that's kind of, you know, people, again, allegations where BitMEX was trading against its customers. I don't think they were ever proven true. But I think in in this situation, like FTX was kind of the BitMEX. And like you mentioned, Alameda was a market maker, but Alameda has insights on what customers, which directions they're betting and can, you know, bet against them and have kind of asymmetric information. And I think that's kind of what was happening. And you see that a lot with, you know, if there was a perp to be had, like you can think of any altcoin, you know, they were on FTX most likely at some point, like and and, and ones without very deep liquidity. So if you wanted to make a, a directional bet long or short against virtually anything, you could do it on FTX. And, you know, if you go to back again, back to BitMEX, like BitMEX, their vehicles were very limited. It was mainly like Ethereum and things like Litecoin and Bitcoin. Like they were, you know, at the time, like the meat and potatoes of the space. You know, FTX was just kind of allowing everything. And I think part of the reason they did that was because they could potentially trade against customers because of this weird relationship between, you know, FTX is the platform, Alameda is kind of like the hedge fund slash market maker, and they could do these things. And I think that's kind of what was happening at a large scale. Yeah, in the traditional world, you would have a pretty clear regulatory division between an exchange and a market maker. And even more so, you'd also have a distinction between the custodian and the broker dealer. And you might have some fiduciary duties to your client and so on. There's kind of two things that stick out at me in relation to this like early phase of FTX. The most insane (laughs) <laughs> statements that Sam makes in public in a recorded setting and publishes to the New York Times is to say that, you know, in the early days when FTX was being set up, they were having trouble opening up a bank account. And this is a real thing. Crypto companies had a lot of trouble opening up a bank account. And I think there's real blame as to the regulators, both in terms of access to banking rails as well as access to you know, ETF wrappers and so on. It's been so difficult for crypto to access regular financial product structure. You know, but FTX was having trouble getting uh, banking rails set up for its international quote-unquote business. So instead, what they did is that they let people wire into Alameda who would then credit the accounts on FTX. 
I wouldn't tell people that I did that. Yeah, and the way he spoke, it, it, it's he spoke like a person that has no fear of prison and is not like threatened in the very least. Like, and, and you have to, you kind of get the sense that you know he's been well versed in what he can and can't say, not only by his internal counsel but by like literally his parents, who are both you know Stanford law professors, and you know they know they know the ins and outs. So he's not going into a blind. I think everything he says is super calculated, and and you know in some of those. You know, in even previous interviews that got released, I forget where they were from exactly. Maybe, maybe it was like a Wall Street Journal interview, but nevertheless, he was saying like, you know, hey, like I, I had unkempt hair because, you know, I wanted people to think I was a mad genius or, you know, I specifically, you know, I donated to not only the Democratic Party, but also the Republican Party. But I, I you know, I was very public about my donations to the Democratic Party because of, you know, potentially the media's left-leaning bias. Like everything he's done is like super calculated and, and quite honestly, it's pretty devious. It's the Boris Johnson approach, right? The hair, like I think Boris Johnson's on the record of like before coming out of his house, he'll go into the bathroom and mix it up a little bit so that when he comes out, he's not like Oxford perfect, he's relatable. Yeah, so it's it's really, it, it's... I don't know. It's, it's super strange that he would say these things in public, you know, on like, yeah, on a, on a, on a podcast like that, that's, you know, literally everyone in the world is watching and scrutinizing. So it's a lot of fun kind of going the conspiracy theory route because it's, it's easy. It's easy to say in all cases, he's obviously a very smart person, but whether he used that intelligence for kind of explicit destruction or not, I think is kind of what's not clear. It's easy and sort of, there's like a dark humor to going into the conspiracy theory land. Like one that really appeals to me is I look at the fintech markets or like the equity markets for early stage venture a lot. And then, you know, on the crypto side, we also spend a lot of time on that. And you could make the argument that Alameda and FTX, it was just a very straightforward arbitrage between the low multiple on a trading business, you know, whatever it is, 1x, 2x times revenue, and the insane multiples in 2021 on B2C fintech and crypto, 50x, 100x. So if you have, you know, two hands and on one side, you can generate a hundred bucks in revenue and it's valued as a hundred. And on the other side, you can generate a hundred bucks and it's valued at a hundred thousand or whatever it is, four hundred twenty million six hundred ninety thousand, then you're going to arbitrage that. And so you can almost see Alameda being a not very good prop trading business or like a loss leading market maker in order to grow and prop up the FTX exchange. Because like any day you would take losses on 1x in revenue and get even a, a tiny proportion of that in the exchange, because that revenue is just so much more valuable. It's almost like an arbitrage that you're doing between the two of them. Yeah. And then if you look at kind of the magnitude of what FTX was doing, like at its peak, they were handling what something like $400 billion in trading volume. It's something like $14 billion a day, which is, is it's staggering, right? And then you kind of add in all their market making. And like, you know, if you just count Alameda and, and FTX as one entity, that is a huge arbitrage opportunity where you can, there's so much you can do there, right? And then it gets into kind of a different pathway is that if you have a project that you like, so for instance, you know, FTX, Sam Bankman Freed, and you know, Almeida, they were heavily into like the Solana ecosystem and Serum, you can kind of push that narrative and, and, and make it to the benefit of that particular ecosystem, right? So if you want Solana to grow, you back it. You put all of its projects, you know, onto onto FTX. You you kind of make them prominent. You make them very visible, and you can kind of start to play with like you know trading volumes, right? You get high trading volumes. You get retail and in, in kind of involved, and voila, like you have like you know you've kind of manufactured an ecosystem, or you help bootstrap it. And I think that's the other angle that he was kind of playing, where he could play God sort of with, with different projects that he, he wanted to kind of endorse. And if you have a, if you have an exchange that, that has, you know, $400 billion of trading volume each month, you can do that. Let's say you're in the equities markets and you have sufficient trading power to move the price around on some penny stock. Definitely market manipulation. 
you know, definitely not something that is a quote unquote good trading strategy, but instead is something that's going to get you into trouble, right? If like your investment strategy is to do all sorts of technical trading stuff in order to make the price go up and down in certain ways to create impressions of various patterns that then lead other people to follow into that investment and then you sell the stock on them, that is definitely not kosher and is market manipulation. So I want to get actually into this point about Serum and FTT and the various tokens that ended up being the canary in the coal mine about their balance sheet because that's the collateral that ended up you know, deflating 90% and, and creating the hole. But before doing that, I actually wanted to ask you a definitional question, which is, BitMEX and FTX, there weren't exchanges in the sense of like, oh, I'm going to come here and buy a Bitcoin with my money. They were derivative exchanges, right? And all of this stuff was trading on margin. And if you read what SBF describes about like Alameda's position and customer positions, like he's constantly talking about how much collateral people have and how levered they are and what the size of the exposure is. Can you walk us through the mechanics of what it means to trade on margin and how is that different from just like buying something spot yeah so when you buy something spot right if, if you know ethereum is you know thirteen hundred dollars today i pay thirteen hundred dollars in you know you know usd busd whatever and i get one ethereum so you buy it spot it's one to one so my thirteen hundred in stables equals one ethereum when you enter into kind of like derivatives and in lever trading you're essentially making der- you know, directional bets on price movements of that underlying asset. So going back to Ethereum, if I think that Ethereum is going to go up in price, I'm going to long it. If I think it's going to go down, I'm going to short it. And so I can take my one Ethereum, which is say again, $1,300 and every, and I, I go long every, you know, 1% it goes up, I get 1% essentially of that 1300, et cetera. But if it's levered, you know, Hey, I may only have thirteen hundred dollars of you know in, in value of Ethereum, but if I go ten x, that thirteen hundred becomes ten times thirteen hundred. It becomes thirteen thousand. So now I can I can make more aggressive bets. Where instead of you know if the price movement of Ethereum goes up one percent, I get one percent. Now if it goes up one percent, I basically get ten percent. And the the risk there obviously is that if it goes down one percent, now I you know I'm down essentially ten percent. So that's essentially how like, you know, having leverage and, and, and working with, you know, kind of collateral, what your collateral is on an exchange and to the untrained or even the trained, like those things can get, they can go good pretty quickly, but they can also go bad very quickly, especially when you have kind of an unwinding and that just kind of, you know, it, 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 it amplifies when you have like how we've seen like lately, how, FTT crashed, everything drops, and everyone who was kind of in levered long positions got liquidated because everything dropped and they were caught on the wrong end of it. What does it mean to be liquidated? What's like a liquidation price? Like, how does that work with margin? Yeah, yeah. So, without getting into like the actual specifics of like the mathematics, but so the long or the, I guess the quick end of it is that if I have, if, again, if I'm taking a $1,300 bet on Ethereum to go long, you know, my liquidation price might be something really, really low. Like it would have to be like $800, right? So I'm basically borrowing. I'm borrowing against the platform. Go back to BitMEX. Like I'm, I'm borrowing from BitMEX. They're going to like support my bet. And then as long as it doesn't go below $800, I'm okay, right? Like I'd pay some premium every eight hours or every day or however they break it. Usually eight, like funding rates are eight, eight hours. Nevertheless, right? As long as the price doesn't dip below some specific other price, right? Like if you're in a 1300, as long as it doesn't dip between 800, you're okay. Like you can open, you can keep that position open over time. You know, you're going to have to pay the funding rate, et cetera. But the more leverage you take, if I take a 10 X position, instead of being 800, it might be like 1220. So if you have a dip in price, you know, basically your bet gets closed out by that exchange and they liquidate, meaning they take your, your collateral, it's gone. So the more leverage you take, the closer your liquidation price is to the spot price at what you purchased that derivative. So again, if it's 1300 and I take a 10 X position, I'm not going to have a lot of leeway if things don't go my, my way because the, you know, the price will hit that, that price point and the exchange will essentially seize and, and take my, my collateral. 
one of the things that we often see in these markets is people talking about like attacking other people's positions. You know, Michael Saylor's Bitcoin liquidation price is whatever it is, 13,000. And as it gets close to it, it's going to get attacked. I start thinking about George Soros and the Bank of England, but like, can you describe what kind of games people play and what does it mean to attack a position like that? And then how does somebody profit from attacking a position like that? Yeah, I think the, the like the classic example is like a short squeeze, right? Kind of when everything is going going wrong and prices are declining, people usually don't get ahead of it until it's kind of been oversold, until it's closer to the bottom. So, you know, again, going back to the example of, you know, Ethereum at 1300, say Ethereum collapses today to 1000, you know, people most likely aren't going to start to, they're not going to short it, you know, at, at 1250, they're probably going to start to short it at like 1050 and closer, closer to that 1000 number, right? So what happens is you have all these people who kind of get in late, and who probably do it with some leverage, like they're probably doing a three, five, 10x. So they're very exposed, and they've kind of bought the bottom. And the beauty of on-chain analytics, and you know, we can see a lot of the positions. I, I might not know exactly what your position is, but I can see the aggregate of it. So I know kind of I have a good idea of where people are in terms of like their directional bets. And you know, if you're short on something and you're shorting it at a very low price after it's already dropped, say 20%, you'll see people come in and what's called a short squeeze is they'll, you know, they'll start to buy the asset up. And basically, the idea is you want to you want to increase the the underlying assets price in relation to the derivative and force liquidation. So even though the actual price movement may continue to trend down, normally when you see market participants that are kind of vulnerable and who are overexposed, and again they bought they short at the bottom, they're overexposed. You'll see people come in and artificially boost the price of the underlying asset to kind of get them liquidated at their profit. Right. So then, you know, they get liquidated, the countervailing party gets a bit of a boost and a profit in the short term, and then they likely close out their own position once they've captured that kind of technical outcome. And then it goes the other way too, right? So let's say there is a a vulnerable token like FTT or some Solana token, and there's a confidence crisis, and Alameda comes out and says, we're going to defend this well, that encourages short sellers to come in and try to sell it as much as possible until the defense kind of breaks, collapses away. And again, then you close out the position and capture the profit. And I think in traditional markets, you've got all sorts of rules about naked short selling versus covered short selling and so on. And there's like, how many turns of leverage can you get from different broker dealers? Not super the same in the crypto world, a lot more open. Okay, so last bit on FTX and Alameda, which is the issues around the balance sheet. So as I understand it, as a percent of total transactions and and a market maker goes from 40% down to 2%, that's Sam's claim. So it is no longer systemically important for the market making on the exchange. And let's say that SBF is focused on running FTX because FTX enterprise value perspective is legitimately a much more interesting and valuable and impactful business than a capital markets desk. And so meanwhile, Alameda, you know, it continues to invest, but it's doing so through FTX and it's investing poorly. So it's losing as it continues to invest. And in order to get margin, i.e. access to capital and leverage from FTX, it needs to put in collateral, i.e. collateralize, you know, put in more stuff so that the liquidation price goes down and so on, right? So they need to keep meeting margin calls. The stuff that they put in are very fragile tokens and potentially tokens that have conflict of interest. So things like FDT, the Solana tokens from all of the projects that the company itself spun up and so on, who are in a black swan scenario aren't going to collapse like 15% or 30%. They're going to collapse 95% and they're going to do that you know, all at once. And so what the story seems to be is that it was just an increasingly large whole backed up by worse and worse collateral. And somehow it was this like black hole that sucked out the good assets off of FTX, i.e. the margin customer assets. And it put in the bubble conflicted sort of synthetic phantom assets from all of the stuff that 
FTX and Alameda engineer together, i.e. invested in the Solana ecosystem and so on. How believable is that story versus like, oh, they just sent over customer accounts? <laughs> I, I think, yeah, I think it might have some legs on it. I, 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 you can kind of see, again, going back to like the on-chain data, where when there was, I guess you can call it a bank run, when people were taking out their assets, at one point, and this is kind of verified by like, I think CoinGlass had some pretty good metrics into it, but it's all over now. But at one point, FTX had literally one Bitcoin in uh, in in their account, so it's like, where did all that Bitcoin go? And and to put that in perspective, you know, Coinbase and Binance, you know, the other larger exchanges have like I forget exactly how much, but they have like half a half a billion Bitcoin or whatever it could be. But so in other words, there's like way way there should be way more than one Bitcoin on the exchange, right? So that, I mean that that does say like what where did that Bitcoin go? Maybe it was exchanged and turned over, and like you said, they try to they try to plug the gap with, you know, Solana and Serum and Maps and all these other projects that they that they held and, you know, at that time had, you know, a certain, you know, they had a, a they had a price at whatever it was at the time. But as you mentioned, like when black swan events happen, those things don't go down 10, 20 percent. They go down like 95 percent all at once. So I think it's very feasible. And again, like that whole on chain data of like literally one Bitcoin in your holdings, like that is incredible. How does that happen? <laughs> so you go, you go from doing 40 billion or $400 billion of, of monthly trading. And then you go to having one Bitcoin in your account. Like that just, yeah. So I think, yeah, I think that most likely happened. I mean, what's interesting is that the killer use case, the feature which made FTX so interesting in the early days, which is that Alameda was willing to market make on absolutely terrible tokens and create all these derivatives because they, I think, had this revenue multiple arbitrage available to them, ended up really blowing up the exchange because the exchange is the one that ended up maybe even unwittingly accepting the terrible tokens that they had let people transact in as collateral and did so kind of unquestioningly. And that kind of triggered the situation today. So I want to zoom out for a second. And we spent a nice amount of time on FTX itself. I want to zoom out to talking about the dominoes and FTX being one of the dominoes in the kind of financial liquidation cascade that's been going on since March. And to say that FTX has actually, it wasn't particularly special relative to, I mean, it was big and it was systemic, but it was one in a chain of a bunch of financial industry failures, financial industry that was serving crypto customers, starting with the collapse of Terra and Luna, but then consequently the collapse of centralized financial firms in the shape of asset managers in the shape of broker-dealers, lenders, sort of capital markets lenders, and exchanges, right? So after the collapse of Terra and Luna, we saw Celsius blow up because Celsius took in customer funds, levered up customer funds, and invested them in things like the sort of yield-generating tokenomic games in Terra Luna. And then when that wiped out to zero, it wiped out all of the customer funds on Celsius. And then once that was gone, you've got players like Voyager that are legitimate broker dealers that were publicly traded on the Canadian exchange that had hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue who had extended credit to Celsius, because where does Celsius get leverage? It gets leverage from other capital markets participants. And so Voyager and a bunch of others, and I think we're only learning everybody who's done it, you know, with Genesis and so on, started to get hit and the loans defaulted for the broker dealers who were lending to Celsius, who had lost largely from the collapse, the underlying collapse of the Terra Luna ecosystem. And then as that became destroyed, FTX came in trying to buy up all essentially their their own creditors or the people that FTX had borrowed from. And the black hole moved on to Alameda. And we've just discussed kind of what that led to. And now as FTX falls apart, we see destruction for Digital Currency Group with a lot of exposure that Genesis had to FTX. We know that like 
venture firms like Multicoin had 10% of their assets sitting on the FTX exchange. That, that'll be written down to zero. And now people are even talking about the collapse of you know, banking providers like Silvergate, who had you know, banked all these crypto assets, but are now experiencing huge outflows, but have the fixed costs of a large company. And so revenues are going to fall and, and you're going to have a huge squeeze on profitability and then destruction there. It's not really a question, that's more of the story, but I wonder, how do you think about that set of liquidations? Like, does it make sense? How much of it has come to light? How much of it is yet to come to light? And like, where are you focused on in terms of seeing which players are in trouble? Yeah, I, I think it makes you know perfect sense. And I think you're, you're spot on about it kind of all started to spiral out with, with Terra Luna and then 3AC. We saw, and, you know, we kind of made a little bit of a recovery in the summer. But the full scope of that contagion was definitely not fleshed out. And you, you kind of had SBF probably for, you know, it was, it was effective altruism. He, he bailed them out and, you know, kept BlockFi afloat, right? But he did it for the people. But no, I, yeah, I think you're right. It, it kind of was, you know, he was intertwined doing things that he shouldn't have been doing. And that if these things fell and more, you know, liquidations would have occurred, he probably, you know, FTX probably would have been insolvent and kind of, you know, it probably would have imploded earlier on. It probably would have been over the summer. They might not have lasted. And I think, yeah, I don't think we've seen the full extent of it. You know, that's just my sense. I, I think that, you know, at this point, I don't trust anything that any entity or any individual says on, you know, crypto Twitter or, you know, I don't, I don't trust any of it. I, I think we've seen in the past, like even Alameda, like, you know, hey, we don't, we don't trade customer assets or, you know, We'll buy all, you know, when, when, when CZ was saying he was going to sell uh, FTT, you know, he had Carolyn from Alameda come out and say like, hey, we'll buy all of it at, you know, $22, no big deal. But do they even have that? Like, no. So I don't trust, I don't, I really don't trust any entity right now. I think that, again, like it goes back to the, a lot of the data is on chain. I think that, you know, detective work and different sleuthing will help figure it out. You know, in terms of some of the, the lenders, you know, we've seen or some of the different entities right now, we've seen BlockFi go under and file for chapter 11, you know, and, and even, you know, Kraken, who I don't even know the extent to which they were involved, but they had to lay off like 30% of their workforce, which is it's brutal, right? And then, you know, Silvergate's another one, you know, they're, I think their exposure, as they were saying, they were maybe less than $20 million for their exposure to BlockFi. I hope they're right, but I don't know. And I think that you, you also have to look at other and not to call out people by name, but just like off the top of my mind, like you have Digital Currency Group, who is super, you know, kind of exposed with with Genesis, and you kind of see the, the fallout with Genesis and on Gemini's Earn program, where now you know if you were doing the Gemini Earn and you were kind of like you weren't staking Ethereum or you weren't you were basically lending Ethereum, you can't get that off of there right now. Withdrawals are, are halted, and then you look at other players like Jump, who you know there's a distinction there, like. Jump trading will be fine. Like Jump is one of the best high frequency traders in the group in the world. Like they'll be fine. They 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 do well. But Jump Crypto, you know, they were heavily involved with Solana. They also participated in some bailouts over the summer. It's you know, it, it, at some point, it's kind of like how far does that contagion go with the fallout on yeah of Solana, of Serum, et cetera. So I would say you know again, this is purely my view, but I think that the worst has yet to come. I, I don't have any hard evidence on that, but I would just say that I think that the impact, full impact of FTX has not been seen yet. I don't know who it's going to be, but I think others will fall. For people who are crypto skeptics, this is like so delicious. It's so pleasant for them to try to paint with a broad brush very different things, which is a financial industry organized as traditional centralized companies, but with poor risk management and poor controls, and trying to use that same brush to say, Hey, this is the same thing as DeFi and blockchain and the Web3 economy, which, you know, it is substantively not. And I think it's, it's intellectually lazy to go that route. Two points come up. The first is, you know, as it relates to like celebrating this destruction, I think just remembering that when this happened to Wall Street, the government response was TARP. Right, which is a government backstop to buy mortgage backed securities and other assets that were worthless or nearly worthless, i.e., FTT, Serum, and all the rest in the case of, of this financial collapse. But the government stepped in and said, look, if we allow this liquidation cascade to continue, it's going to take down all of the banks and our entire capital markets. And so we're going to backstop 
the financial industry and allow these incorrect valuations to persist because we need these banks as infrastructure. In crypto, like there's no tarp, right, for this stuff. And that's kind of what we need. But the closest I've seen is the billion dollar Binance Recovery Fund and then proof of reserves. What's your view on that? Like one billion seems low. How do you think about whether that's equivalent to TARP? Yeah, I think, yeah, it's nowhere near the magnitude, right? Like one billion isn't going to really get the job done. I think it'll help. But that's just from Binance. I think like moving forward, like maybe something in a similar vein where other ecosystem participants engage in that sort of relief fund. But right now, like, Who really has money to do that? I think we're all liquidity crunch. Nobody really has a lot of capital to deploy. I mean, finance might be one of the few that are in the position to do that. But yeah, I I think moving forward, the proof of reserve is super important, but equally important is the proof of liabilities, right? Because if I know what an exchange or what an entity's reserves are, that's fine. Like they might have $300 million of reserves. Great. Great. But I have no insights on what their liabilities are. So I think that getting data that shows both reserves and liability, that allows you to get a sense of what that entity's net equity is. I think that's super important. I think we're going to have that. There's there's some, there's some again, going back to on-chain data analytics, there's a lot of on-chain data analytics companies that are kind of building out those dashboards. I think that's kind of the silver lining where I think that Time and time again, we've seen within the Web3 industry where we there's like an attack, things collapse, but people here are really resilient and they're very creative. So I think that the next time around, it, not to say it won't happen, but I think that there will be more tools and more stop gaps in place that kind of help prevent it. And I think that that's like a good starting point is the relief fund A, but also the proof of reserve slash proof of liabilities. And, and also, real quick, just to touch on, like, at the core of DeFi, right, there's two things. One is that if you're going to do, if you want to participate in the decentralized finance economy, you do those things on chain, right? If you want to make a trade, you trade with a DEX, right? You trade on Uniswap or you trade on Curve. You don't use, like, an institutional lender. Like, that's, that's the core root of a decentralized finance. And the other thing is custody versus non-custody. I think best practices are... You never want to give up custody of your assets. And whether that's an exchange hot wallet, like you don't want to give SPF custody of your assets, right? Because this is what happens. And and that they were always best practices, right? We've seen that with wallets in the space like MetaMask and Ledger. Like not, you know, keep your keys, right? <laughs> not your not your keys, not your crypto. But it's serious, right? Like, and those again, that's the gold standard. And I think that moving forward, we see people go back to that and they're no longer okay with putting out their capital without retaining custody of it. So I think you're going to see that. And I think we've already seen that with like the massive outflow of assets off of exchanges. We, we've already kind of seen that. Again, on-chain data confirms it. So we have huge outflows. It even created, like if you look at the data with Ethereum, there was tons of outflow where it made Ethereum probably the most deflationary it's ever been because people were doing high volume transactions. So a lot of Ethereum is getting burned. And it made Ethereum go, you know, pretty, pretty low into its deflationary stage. It's kind of trending back up to inflationary. But that's kind of the volume and the magnitude we saw where people are taking custody of their crypto. They're, they're going back to first principles of using DeFi and, and keeping their crypto on the, on the cold wallets and, you know, MetaMask, et cetera, and not on hot wallets, exchange wallets. So I think those are kind of the silver linings and kind of help this thing moving forward. And again, your point real quick is that, yeah, the, the skeptics will say like, oh, yeah, like I told you so, like, you know, cryptos, you know, scam and et cetera. But all of this kind of has transpired on things that are not blockchain, <laughs> like traditional kind of institutions, right? So they're market makers, they're CFI institutions, et cetera. They're not, they're not necessarily protocols or they're not, not necessarily linked to blockchain technology in any meaningful way. Absolutely. We're up on time. And the line that is sticking with me is, if you give money to SBF, this is what will happen. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for joining today. If our audience wants to find you on social media or anywhere else, where should they go? I would say that Twitter is probably the best. It is mega underscore fun. And yeah, feel free to feel free to reach out and give me a follow. Thanks, Lex, for having me. Always a pleasure. This is fantastic. 
Hi, everyone. That's it for this week's episode of the Fintech Blueprint. For more technical deep dives into all things fintech and decentralized finance, check out fintechblueprint.com and grab a free subscription to the newsletter. This is Lex, and I'll see you next time.